Welcome to the first edition of the Arnie Ball Show for the 2000 season. Today we're going to preview our upcoming tournament this weekend at the Hilliard Gates Center. In addition to that, we have Lloyd Ball, the setter of the U.S. national team with us, who will be our special guest. And when Arnie and I come back, we'll talk about something, but we don't know what it is yet, so please stay with us. As the American military gets smaller, who will be there to answer the call? They will. They're the National Guard and Reserve, and they make up half of today's military forces. As an employer, you may be asked to support their mission. Remember, their response depends on yours. Welcome to the Arnie Ball Show. I'm your host, Mark Franke, and this is the first show we're having for the 2000 season. Normally during this segment, Arnie and I try to talk about last week's uh, games, and I have trouble keeping Arnie on, on focus on, on the topic anyway, so it doesn't really matter what we talk about in this segment, although I should point out, Arnie, that Bernie Lowe Miller, the head honcho of, of uh, Channel 56, is here in the studio. This must be a very important event. Not only is he in the studio, he's wearing a tie, white shirt and a tie. So you must have an important meeting after this, right? It <laughs> can't be for us. Okay, nice answer, Arnie. Just if you, actually, if you, if you would be more like that on the bench, I think both your assistant coaches and your players would be a lot happier. That's quite frankly, and I, I did forget to say the sponsors, didn't I? We have new sponsors, new sponsors this year. Same as last year, you won't answer questions. I forget the sponsors. We have Fujifilm back, and we have a new sponsor that is Northeastern REMC. And uh, that's uh, one that's personally gratifying for me because Greg Keese, the president there, is a very close personal friend of mine. So how's that? Who hired you for this job? Um, my agent. My mm -hmm. agent had a major contract discussion with uh, the university, and I'm getting like a uh, million dollars a segment or something like that. You're pa under payable later on sometime. You're definitely underpaid. I'm underpaid. We got to talk to Bernie about that. No wonder he's got a tie on today. For, fortunately, the first segment is only six minutes, and when those six minutes hope, rapidly draw to a close, we all hope uh, we'll get Loy on here and have an intelligent conversation. How's that? Tell us about your New Year's Eve uh, celebration. I, I did not have a New Year's Eve celebration. I um, looked yep. out my back window, and some neighbors were having a really noisy party. I went over there to quiet it down, and it took me several hours to accomplish that. So that's why you were at my house that's all the time. That's why I was at your house. That's right. I wonder why you were hanging around my house all the time. Yeah, well. Now I know. That's why. Huh? That's why. So um, we really need to talk about volleyball if we can. Why? We don't ever do it any other time. Why should we start now? Let's talk about uh, our loss to Long Beach in the national finals, semifinals last year. and Perhaps uh, start the year off on a I wanna, note. <laughs> I want to talk about Dan and his, and his Baltimore. Oh, no, Indianapolis Colts T-shirt he's got on. The Colts are in Indianapolis? Now I thought they are in Baltimore. Oops. Maybe, maybe I said it wrong. Yeah. Maybe it is Baltimore. Does Johnny United still play for him, Dan? Huh? No. Maybe, okay. oh, I guess not. Back to volleyball. Anyhow, what are we going to talk about? V volleyball. I, I understand that uh, Volleyball Magazine has put out their preseason rankings, and we're number three. That's a media publication. They don't know what they're talking about. Where would you put us? Uh... Down, down. Way down? Down lower than three. So you're uh, rather pessimistic about the season? Uh, I, no, I think we're going to have a great season, but I'd kind of like to. Actually, we should have been number one, to be real honest with you. Well, uh, we weren't number one. We're I know, number three, but we should we'll, we'll work on that because we're going to get a chance to play uh, one of the teams that's ranked above us right now. And when we come back. Are we done already? We're, yeah. Wow. Isn't that. God is hurry. merciful. We are done with this segment. And when we come back. Um, Lloyd Ball, no relation to Arnie, will uh, will come on and we'll talk about the U.S. national team and maybe he'll have some comments about the IPFW volleyball team. So please stay with us. What would you do if you had to choose between the buffalo? and the giraffes between a flower or an elephant what would you choose 
What if you had to decide between a hundred-year-old tree and a million-year-old beach? Between drinking clean water or breathing clean air? Would you make the right choice? Would there be a right choice? Now there's a way to help. Not just one, but all these things. Earthshare. The world's leading environmental groups working together. It's one choice we can all live with. Ask your employer about workplace giving. Welcome back to the Arnie Ball Show. And in this segment, I have the pleasure of interviewing one of the members of the Ball family who actually will be responsive and I'm sure give us some very interesting information, some insights into the uh, USA National Volleyball team, which just, which just this last weekend qualified for the Sydney Olympics. Welcome back to IPFW, Lloyd. Thank you, Mark. Good to be here. Tell us a little bit about uh, last weekend's tournament. Well, uh, last weekend was well, obviously a big week for the USA men's volleyball team. We had the uh, Continental Cup, which is up in Winnipeg, Canada. Which I wouldn't recommend. in January. That's, yeah, I wouldn't recommend <laughs> for any uh, vacation spots. Uh, a little cold, uh, below zero there. Uh, every day we were there, but we had Mexico, Puerto Rico, uh, Canada, and ourselves in a four-team tournament with the uh, winning team winning uh, our zone's berth to the Olympic uh, Olympics in Sydney. Had a rough start and it actually lost uh, three-zero uh, to Canada the first night out in front of about five thousand Canadian fans. Uh, tremendous gathering. Uh, they did a great job up there with the match. Luckily came back next night and uh, won 3-0 against Mexico and then Puerto Rico the following night 3-0 and got a little bit of the rust off. Uh, we hadn't played since World Cup about a month before. And then the final match, once again, 5,000 Canadians and uh, this time the result was a little better. 3-0 in favor of uh, the country a little south of them and uh, much of their disliking, we're going and they're not. So uh, a real good week for us. I know when I first heard that uh, you'd lost 3-zip to Canada, I thought, no, they just reported it backwards, somebody got it wrong. No, they actually had a different team than we saw this whole year. They brought back uh, four veterans uh, from a couple years ago who've been playing overseas. And it was a different team than we saw World Cup. And uh, actually, after the World Cup in December, they went to Poland for a tour. So had had some game experience as, as of recent, uh, unlike ourselves, who had just been practicing and training. So luckily, we had those couple games uh, before the finals to get our stuff back together again. But then just a great performance by some of our young guys in the finals in a real tough situation, you know, playing in front of... Uh, no, no American fans, all Canadian, and obviously they're real excited trying to get their team back to the Olympics. Uh, Canada hasn't been back there since 84. And, uh, but luckily we played real well and uh, kept pressure on them and came out with a victory. Got a couple new players on the team this year that uh, graduated from college last year, and, and uh, they seem to be making quite a difference. You know, this is, uh, since I've been on the team, this is the first time we've had people right out of college come in and make such, uh, like you said, a huge difference on our team. Uh, Ryan Millar, who uh, was with BYU, who won the national championship, obviously, as you know, this past year. Uh, came and st starting middle force right away out of college. And then George Romain from Pepperdine, also a, a big opposite, is coming and play for us. And uh, they're both doing a tremendous job and carrying a real strong load for us. One of the uh, uh, weak spots of the USA team in past years has been on the left side. And certainly George can help some with that, but he's primarily a, a right side hitter uh, in that kind of offense. But even your left sides are, are doing a much better job offensively, aren't they? I mean, that, that was just uh, the reason why we won. We didn't pass uh, terrific throughout the whole tournament, uh, but well enough where we could set a little bit of our middles to keep the uh, Canadian block honest. But the big difference was just Mike Lambert from the left side. He was hitting over the smaller setter, Kent Greaves, for the Canadians every time. And then uh, as soon as they started shifting out that way, we had big George Romain on the right side hitting over their uh, uh, other outside blocker. So it was kind of picking and choosing and actually easy task for me, uh, which I always appreciate. Uh, just setting a high ball one way or the other, and, and our two big hitters uh, who've just developed nicely, and I think if we can continue to develop them through the Olympics, they're just going to be dominating in Sydney. Who are some of the other players that are, are key contributors to the USA team right now? You know, right now, in this last tournament, Dan Landry came off the bench uh, after our loss uh, the first time to Canada. Hasn't really played in the starting lineup a lot in the last couple of years. Uh, was an Olympian in 96, but has just really come and studied out our passing, done a tremendous job defense-wise for us. Uh, Eric Sullivan is our libero, uh, who comes in and passes all the time, plays defense for us. And then just having guys like John Hyden, also an Olympian, uh, and Kevin Barnett, who graduated from Pepperdine, uh, in the outside hitting position, come in and uh, pass well and, and bring a lot of power on that left side, which, as you mentioned before, we'd kind of been missing in the past few years. 
it's just a real strong, deep team. Uh, you know, we have 12 good players who can play at any time. You know, it's nice to have guys like Tom Sorensen, I know college All-Americans and Olympian in the 96, come off the bench in case your young guy gets a little tired. What's happened to uh, the Ball State players that were with the team, Romano and uh, Big Phil? Big Phil. Right now, uh, Greg Romano is still in the hunt for our Libro position. Him and Eric Sullivan battle every day in that position. And uh, Phil Easton is our fourth middle. Uh, we travel with three uh, right now, which is Tom Hoff, uh, Ryan Millar, as I mentioned, and Jeff Nygaard is our third. Uh, but if we travel with four, Phil Easton from Ball State would be the fourth. And he's still pushing Jeff Nygaard right now for that third spot. Phil really developed a lot from when he first started playing for Ball State. I never would have guessed that when he was a freshman he'd end up on the Olympic team. It's amazing, Mark, to see just how he's transformed physically. You know, he's by far our strongest player, upper and lower body. He's just spent so much time in, in the weight room. Uh, you know, and as you say, he's a little bit goofy back in college. Uh, wasn't the smoothest thing to watch, but he's just really worked on his skills and grown into his body and become a real, a real dominating force in the middle and international level. When you played the Puerto Rican team, would there have been any players on there from... Uh, IPFW or Penn State or any, any, anybody that our local fans might recognize. Absolutely. Uh, in the first time we played in the Orsega Championships, Raul Papaleo, who I, was, uh, who I played three years with, uh, was an outside hitter for him. And most recently up in Canada, Norman Amadovar, who uh, was the same year as I, played all four years together here at IPFW, I was passing hitting outside for him. So it was always interesting to look across the net and see someone that you know, I hadn't played with since college uh, playing against him this time. And Puerto Rico had a real nice tournament. Norman was uh, tremendous on their left side. Uh, just unfortunately for Puerto Rico, not quite physical enough to compete with Team Canada or Team USA. Puerto Rico's teams have always tended to be a little shorter than the other teams. They've been quick, but they're not physically as strong either, There's, and that's probably as much due to size as anything, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think they're as athletic as any team internationally. Unfortunately, other teams are, you know, six, 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 seven athletic, and Puerto Rico's six, three, six, four athletic, and and over a long period of time, uh, the height does make a difference. Looking ahead to the Olympics uh, in Sydney which is on the other side of the world, so it'll be interesting to play the Summer Olympics in what is almost summer there, I guess. <laughs> uh, what, what do you see as the major competition for USA if, if we're to bring the gold back home? Well, I think right now, uh, you know, we have moved up from 10th in the, in the world ranking to 5th, uh, which is a big jump, I think, for any team. And uh, right now, teams ahead of us, uh, Russia, who just got done winning the World Cup, uh, who we lost to in five in that tournament, I think is right now the best team uh, Italy is always tough, even though we beat them in three in the World Cup, as well as Cuba, uh, Yugoslavia, and Brazil, and then us rounding out the top five. I think those are the five teams to look for uh, for medals. The one thing I like about our team is that we've not been together very long uh, with, with Ryan Millar and George Romain joining us just recently, and then everyone being pretty relatively young, you know, myself being one of the older people at 27 is nice where I think our team is going in the direction upward and improving up until the Olympics where these other teams who are maybe a little bit ahead of us in the ranking are pretty much maxed out I think and I think uh, you know we'll close that gap by the Olympics and hopefully overcome them when we get there. Do you think the youthfulness will will help in the long stretch between now and the Olympics and then going to the Olympics and playing almost every day that uh, the older teams will tend to tire sooner and that that will be an advantage? I really do I think you know right now we have about three months off of playing uh, where our younger guys are in the weight room every day, they're training, uh, working on some ball handling type stuff. And then we go right into the World League, which is a pretty rigorous schedule. And then not too far after that, the Olympics rolls around. And I think that kind of schedule is really tough on an older team, where not only because of our youth, but because, like I mentioned before, we are 12 players deep. We play a lot of people, and I think that will keep us uh, to have a lot of fresh legs come September in Sydney. Who's your backup as setter? Chip McCall. Played at Pepperdine, won a national championship there with Tom Sorensen. Let's talk a little bit about uh, your pro career. Uh, you don't train year-round with the national team, only about half the year mm -hmm. play with them, and the other half the year you have to work for a living, right? Yeah, it's amazing how that works out. You think they could just pay me a little enough to stay in the country for the whole year. But the, the past three winters, I've uh, played for a team in Japan, uh, a small city in Mishima, which is about an hour and a half uh, inland from Tokyo. Uh, this winter is my first year I'm actually not playing professionally uh, because of the late qualifier in Canada. It was just too difficult to get a team, and I felt uh, for a good push in, in Sydney, I needed to just to stay home and work on some physical strength stuff. But the last three years, yeah, I've been fortunate to have a good financial situation as well as a good team to play for in Japan. And uh, I can tell you this, you know, culturally, obviously, it's a lot different. Uh, my wife and I enjoyed it very much so. Uh, a lot of bowing, a lot of taking your shoes off. And I hope you like fish and rice because you're going to get lots of it <laughs> if, uh, if you're going to go over there. But you stay pretty fit that way, and uh, great people, had a great time, great experience. 
You've been back home for a couple of days now, and you've had a chance to watch your dad's team practice. Of course, you were at the NCAA's last year and, and went through that heartbreaker with us. Yeah. What do you see as the big difference in the team? Just for a couple, from a couple of days watching in practice, what do you see as the difference? Well, I think the biggest thing is this. I mean, they already look bigger and stronger than I thought they were at the Final Four. Uh, you know, Scott Lane and, and uh, Gislin and, and the whole crew, I think, have really spent some time this summer not only improving their game but improving their physiques and their physical conditioning. Uh, it amazes me how well they're serving. Uh, the new freshman from uh, Puerto Rico, Angel, uh, I think he's going to be a big help to us in the middle, which I thought was maybe our little weakness last year. But, you know, if we keep everybody healthy, as, as every coach and every team hopes, and I see no reason why this team shouldn't repeat back to the Final Four and, and hopefully come away with a little better decision. Uh, I'm really impressed. They've worked really hard. And uh, I was really amazed how spirited they were in practice. You know, for a, yesterday for a Monday, I remember back when I had to come to practice on Monday. It wasn't always the most spirited thing in the world. Uh, but without much prodding from Dad and the other coaches, they were really into it. And I can tell there's a real focused look on all their faces. Yeah, we've got a lot of seniors this year, and I think they'd like to get the job done. They know how close they came last spring. Yeah, I think that's part of it, you know, having that kind of senior leadership, uh, not just one or two guys, but a bunch of seniors, and everyone getting a taste of it last year. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of fiery speeches and a, and a lot of butt kickings uh, in the gym, and I know they want to go back. What do you think uh, um, of the, the rankings that have just come out? They've got uh, Long Beach number one, which is no surprise, really, but uh, USC is uh, ranked number two above us, and we've beaten them each of what the last three years rather easily. So, Well, I think you and I both know that the Midwest teams are never going to win that battle. Uh, <laughs> as long as the, that magazine is uh, produced on the West Coast, I think they're always going to get the edge on us. And speaking to Dad, and, and as being part of that back when I played IPFW, you know, obviously we always felt that we weren't ranked as high as we should have been. But uh, that's just part of the game, and it's not where you uh, start the season, it's where you finish. Right. And I think the players understand that. They don't give you a trophy for leading the rankings in any given week, do they? They really don't. No, they really don't. Uh, before we close out here, any word of advice for our, our players? The only thing I can tell them uh, you know, is I hope they learn a lot from that experience last year. Don't let it go five. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you win it when you can. Uh, that's always the key. And I think... Uh, you know, them missing out just by that barely. Uh, hopefully they'll come out this year with that killer instinct and, and put the foot down. Well, Loy, uh, it's nice talking to you. <coughs> and, uh, good luck uh, with the rest of the competition in the World League and then certainly on to Sydney for the Olympics. When uh, we come back, we'll have uh, Arnie back, and hopefully he will be ready to answer some questions. And if not, we'll fake it. <laughs> so please stay with us. Get the keys. Friends don't let friends drive drunk. Welcome back to the Arnie Ball Show. Arnie, I forgot to ask Loy about uh, the USA teams coming to Fort Wayne in June uh, to play at the Coliseum. That's correct, Mark. They're going to be in here on June 30th, July 1st. There'll be two matches, uh, both held at the Coliseum uh, with Brazil. Uh, it's the final weekend of the World League. Uh, before the championship match, which I believe are in Holland. I think that's where the championships are going to be held. Uh, so we're excited about having those two teams here. Uh, you know, at this point, I think Brazil is ranked number four, and we're ranked number five, and both have qualified for the Olympics, so it should be an exciting weekend. There will be more information on tickets and so forth coming out in the local media on that uh, closer to the event. Should, it's going to be all announced this week, so it should be out uh, this week. Well, let's focus on this weekend. We've got a... Uh, uh, kind of a preseason type tournament. We have Concordia of New York, who's in the Eastern Conference uh, uh, in volleyball, and American University of Puerto Rico, which is an NCAA member, and this year coached by our alum Raul Papaleo. So, what do we what, do? We have to play those two teams. Is that what I we're doing? I think we have to play those two teams. Oh. Well, it should be a good tournament. Ohio State will also be here, so to give us a chance to look at them. Well, obviously, we won't play them, but it gives us a chance to look at them and them to look at us before we have to go over there next week and play them. Yeah, we'll talk more about that trip to Ohio State next week because that's going to be an important match, yeah. and that's a heck of a way to start the season. Who scheduled that? Uh, the athletic director. Hanson did probably, oh, right? Oh, no. 
Coach totally Hanson? Me. Yeah. Uh, we've played Concordia and American the last couple of years, but down in Puerto Rico in, in March in that tournament that American University put on in the past. And this year we've got them coming up here in January. Kind of paybacks, right? Well, I tried to put this thing together uh, with the Sports Corporation because we're calling the Sports Corporation shootout and they're helping us put it on. And I tried to get a couple teams uh, from out in California. And, uh, you know, when you're really a good team, uh, teams from California don't want to come this way. Uh, you and Lloyd alluded to the fact that we'd beaten USC and, and Long Beach before, and you know, out here in our territory. And so uh, I think they're all afraid of uh, what happened back in 1994, and so they're not going to allow themselves to come out here and get bushwhacked by us. And so when that happened, uh, Yvonne over at Concordia, who's, who's become a good friend of ours, I called him and asked if he'd be uh, willing to come. Of course, he was tickled to death to come and play us in, in Ohio State. And when we found out Raul was going to be the coach at American University, and they've been very good to us the last, what, three or four years we've been going down there, uh, I called and asked if he would come up, and uh, it would be a good opportunity for Raul to come back to Fort Wayne and bring his team and his first year of coaching, and hopefully we can give him his first loss. That's right. That'd be, that'd be a lot of fun. Actually, it might be a second loss because we don't play him until Saturday night. Uh, could be a second loss then. Coach Hanson. One of two, us. anyhow. Yeah. Uh, before I forget this, uh, the matches this weekend will be televised on Channel 56. We'll start at 8 o'clock both Friday and Saturday night. On Friday, we'll play Concordia of New York, and then on Saturday, we'll play Raul's American University team of Puerto Rico, which is in the city of Bayamon. And that was, that was the place last year. Remember when I got uh, the bus driver ditched me in that one, uh, we're at a, some stoplight or something, and I, I had to find my way to the uh, gym. I, I did make it. I was an hour late, but I made it. Was that the same trip or same time when uh, uh, Hector was hanging out of the bus? Yeah, he jumped out of my car, jumped on the bus to tell him he was turning the wrong way, and, and I was in the right lane, and meanwhile... Anyhow, another yeah. Puerto Rican story. And I, and I had to... I stopped at several places, asked for directions in Spanish, and... and uh, actually knew enough Spanish to follow the directions. Actually, that wasn't as bad as when we were in California and you left Norman at the restaurant. Uh, well, no, I think you were the one who did that. I don't think it was me. I think it was you. I I'm sure that Norman probably brought that up when he was playing Loy last week. <laughs> He'll never forget that. I did teach that cocky young freshman a little bit about... Uh... <laughs> uh, tell us a little bit about how you see our team developing um, Loy mentioned he thought Angel is going to do real well. He's a freshman out of Puerto Rico in the middle. Uh, you brought a couple players in at uh, mid-year that uh, nobody's really seen much of. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the new players? Those kids we brought in at the mid-year, I haven't seen much of either. So, you know, it's kind of a crapshoot for everybody. Well, the luxury we have is having five of the starting six kids back from last year's team. Uh, and certainly when, when that happens, uh, you don't have to work nearly as hard at the fundamental kinds of things, especially within your systems, because those kids all know those. Uh, with Angel coming in, uh, Angel doesn't have a, a, a great deal of experience, but he's very athletic. And he's someone in the middle that would remind me a lot of, uh, of uh, Pepa, when Pepa was here. Uh, he, gets, he gets up early and we can set him the ball off the net and do some things like that. Uh, <clears throat> Angel's going to be a really nice addition and, and really plugs a hole that uh, we felt we needed to do some, some, some things with offensively in particular. Uh, so we're real pleased with that. Uh, a couple of the new guys, Aris's brother, er, brothers here, Panos is here, and he's probably going to be in our libero player and, and brings some, a lot of ball handling skills to our, to our team, and we're really excited about him. He's a little older like Scotty Lane, and so it brings some additional maturity to our team as well. Uh, <clears throat> Matt Kent, who's a kid from Virginia, uh, 6'6", and Lo Loy commented yesterday he looked like, uh, played like Quentin Spiegel, and I went, well, at least he, 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 goes, a compliment? To, he goes to class, you know. Uh, uh, <laughs> but he is going to be a lot like Quentin, and Quentin obviously was a fine player for us, and, and Matt is going to be really, really a nice player too. So we're excited about having him here. Uh, two new kids we have in at the semester are uh, John Scott and John Thompson. John Thompson is a, tr is a co junior college transfer from California. Uh, is not in playing shape and would admit to that, so we have to get him in playing shape because he's been doing some other things to make sure he could financially afford to come here and do some things like that. And then John Scott is a young man out of Texas who reminds me a lot of uh, Javier. Uh, jumps like Javier. Well, he's shorter. Well, he's taller. Than oh, is he really he's tall? taller than Javier. Uh, jumps like Javier, you know, he's really explosive. Thinking, got that big smile everybody likes. Uh, but he doesn't have a lot of background playing, so we're, we'll take us some time to train him. Uh, but he's very, very athletic and fun to watch. Real quickly, 
the new rule change this year uh, for us is the libero. Can you give us a 30 second explanation of why he wears a funny colored shirt? I wish I could explain the whole the position, but because I'm not sure about it myself. But in a, in a real short uh, time here, uh, he wears a different colored shirt because he doesn't have to be registered with the scorekeeper to go in and out of the game, and therefore the officials know that he's an okay guy to go in and out of the game, and he can substitute into the back row for anybody at any time. Uh, usually it's for the middles because those are the guys aren't quite as strong defensively. Uh, he's not allowed to spike out of the back row and he's not allowed to go in front of the 10 foot line and set in, in front of the... Or serve. Uh, and he's not allowed to serve. But uh, the intent was to make the game more, more uh, uh, fan friendly, more rallies, things like that. When I was up watching the U.S. team in Canada play this weekend, I thought what really is happening is it's made our, made our team's passing so much better because these guys are passing specialists. Now the offenses are better. And so it's not necessarily made the defense better, it's made the side offense better. Uh, and Panos is a very good passer, and so it, it should help our team in that regard. So that really gives us seven players to use full time, doesn't it? That's correct. That's and absolutely correct. That helps the deeper teams. <clears throat> well, and, and it helps, uh, and in Panos' case, he's not necessarily short, he's about 6'3, but it, it, it helps uh, give an opportunity to someone who maybe has some quickness and ball handling skills. Uh, that maybe not as quite as big and strong as some of the other players to really get a chance to play. And they do make some exciting plays, there's no doubt about that. Well, the first chance to see this excitement in the, the official season will be this weekend, again, Friday and Saturday night at 8 o'clock in the Gates Center. We have Concordia University of New York and American University of Puerto Rico. On Friday night, it's Concordia. Saturday night, it's American. If you can't make it to the gym, be sure to turn in to, tune in to Channel 56 because both will be televised. For Arnie Ball and our guest Lloyd Ball, this is Mark Franke saying thanks for watching. Welcome to the Arnie Ball Show. This week we're going to preview our upcoming MIVA conference match at Ohio State. Hector Soda is our guest and we'll talk to him about uh, his last year here at IPFW. And when we come back, Arnie and I will discuss last week's Sport Corp tournament at IPFW. So please stay with us. Every day, 10 children are killed by gunfire. You can help stop the violence. Call 1-800-WE-PREVENT. Not one more lost life. Not one more grieving family. Not one more. Gone to graveyards one by one. Oh, when will we ever learn? Welcome to the Arnie Ball Show. I'm your host, Mark Franke, and our sponsors this year are Fuji Film, and we have a new sponsor, a consortium of REMC electrical co-ops that uh, have joined us for the first time, and I probably should use this opportunity to say hello to my friend Greg Key, since I followed up the sponsorship thing last time, and he let me know about that. You just keep talking to him, Mark. Just, just make, keep make talking up to him. Greg. Keep him happy. That's all well, I care. Well, Greg, uh, who's president of Northeastern REMC, is... IPFW alum, big volleyball fan. He told me that his colleague over at uh, Noble County REMC is a Ball State alum. And so when we play Ball State, I guess we'll have to dwell on that a little more. So are we, we're going to have dueling REMCs? Is we that, may, we is may that have, what it'll be? We may have dueling REMCs prior to that match. I think we, we make that uh, between games two and three. We'll just take 10 minutes and we'll put, put them on each side let, of the court and let them let them go. one another. I, that's a good idea. We ought to talk to Greg about that, oh, actually. I, I, will, I will bring it up. Mention I will that mention, to him. I, I will think that's a cool idea. Last weekend, uh, we opened the season at home. Had fairly nice crowds, considering that uh, we had a lot to compete with in town, and we didn't have a real big draw like a California team or a big conference team or Penn State. But we still had nice crowds, and I think the fans enjoyed seeing 
their uh, Mastodons come back to play. I thought the crowd was really good on Saturday night. Wasn't nearly as strong on Friday night as numbers wise, but both nights the crowd I thought was really into it. Uh, we had great coverage on the electronic media, and, and we had great coverage out of the News Sentinel and Journal. You know, before the tournament was over. Unfortunately, there were very little results from the Journal and the News of Sentinel on uh, Saturday night, and I'm a little disappointed in that. But uh, I certainly thought the crowds were great. It was kind of nice to uh, have our old friend and alum uh, Raúl Papaleo come in as coach of the American University team. American University is in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and he just started coaching that team this year, and they've made a dramatic improvement over last year, didn't they? Well, I'm 1-0 and zero against former alums, so I, that's it. We're not going to play no more. Not going to play any more former alums? That's right. Okay, we can do that. We won't be playing any former alums this year. We don't, have any, we don't have any other ones? I don't think Aren't so. Are coaching? I don't think so. Well, we're, we're good for this year then. It was great we're, to see Raul, though. It's great to see Raul. Uh, he was introduced just like he was always introduced when he was playing, not quite six foot tall. I kind of brought back fond memories for some of us, didn't it? It was a wide smile on his face. A wide smile end. on his face. That was for sure. That was a wonderful little piece of introduction that you concocted there. Now, for those of you who uh, may not be on the inside of that, uh, Raul was uh, always listed as six foot one, and none of us ever believed it. <laughs> Even though he jumped like he was about six six, he mm. did not look like he was six one. And so uh, we, we used to play games with him when we, he was introduced, and so we Thought, I think it was, might have been Coach Johnson behind this because whenever uh, there's a dirty trick being played, Coach Johnson is not far away. So we introduced him as uh, still not quite six foot tall. Well, all I know is, is that uh, I think he enjoyed it and I didn't have anything to do with it. Well, the interesting thing about his team is uh, he's trying to rebuild a team. He had virtually, I don't think he had anybody back from last year, did he? They played with a makeup team last year. And he had two setters, both of whom flunked out of school or became academically ineligible. So we had no setters when he came to Fort Wayne. Well, unfortunately for Raul, that, that certainly was the case, so they had no middle attack, so it became pretty predictable where they were going to set the ball. And because of that, they struggled, obviously. And But once again, I think Raul has the right idea. He's, if he's patient, he'll build that program, and, and it'll come back. And, you know, they have a great recruiting base, not only from the Puerto Rican kids, but from the Dominican kids and the Haitian kids, and, I mean, all those kids who Venezuela. want to come to... To Puerto Rico and or the states, so he's a real good base to build from, and he'll do a good job. I did give him the business, so I didn't bring his dad with him. We were really looking forward to seeing Papa Papaleo, weren't we? Not particularly. Not particularly. <laughs> but I would have really liked to see his mama. Yes. You know, Mama and, and Vanessa and, and Laura. Now, that would have been okay. But That'd been okay. Papa, you know, Papa, Papa's I just leave Papa, him down you know? yeah. on the island. Right? <laughs> oh. The other team that's here is American University, which uh, I'm sorry is Concordia uh, College in Bronxville, New York which is a small school. I think uh, we learned it only had like 600 kids in it or something. Or less. Or yeah. less. And they play in the East Coast, and they gave us all we wanted on uh, Friday night, didn't they? Well, they did it in the beginning. Once we got our jump serving cranked in, especially Scotty, you know, they had a lot of trouble keeping up with us, and I think that's going to be significant all year long with teams that we play. But Yvonne has done a good job there at Concordia. You know, he's really limited because of numbers. But he has, a, once again, a strong base to, to draw from. Uh, he comes from Puerto Rico, so he has that connection. And, of course, New York City, where you have 6 million people, you ought to be able to find one or two live bodies that could play some kind of volleyball. Well, um, you'd think so. Mm -hmm. Actually, they had a nice setter who uh, my wife thinks we ought to recruit. I said, well, I didn't think he was all that great. She says, well, but he's cute, so that kind of makes up for it. Now, I don't know what... Now, I don't know whether she's comparing him to Chris Gislin in that respect or not. And if we get Chris on the show, I'll be sure and ask him that. We've got to do something about your wife and my wife. My wife wants to adopt Scotty Lane because, once again, she thinks he's cute. Um, I can't, we can't afford these guys, you and I. Can we? Well, I don't I know can't. why we couldn't. Well, well you got a house big enough. We can put them in your house, but I don't want them in my house. You don't want them in my house. Yeah, well, they're not moving in with me. I well, mean, but you got a room. You can I recruit them. And, yeah. Um, the other thing that we probably ought to mention about Coach Yvonne uh, from Concordia is that it was 2.30 in the morning before I got him out of my house Saturday night. He can really talk. He can talk forever. I mean, it doesn't make a difference who he's talking to either. No, he just, people wander in and out of his conversation. It, he just kept going, didn't It didn't make he? any difference. I mean, the man never drew a breath. And the longer he went, the faster he talked. Uh, he definitely is from Puerto Rico. There's no doubt about it. He can, it, man can really talk, and 
He's a slick strike. I don't know what he was doing down on the floor in one of the games doing. The Cobra. He he called push it the cobra? What do you call it? The Cobra or something? I thought he was doing push ups, but he had a special name for it. I don't He 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 kind of in volleyball the uh, I don't know whether it's an actual rule, but it's certainly the, the protocol that the coach stays seated. He paces and kneels and runs out on the floor. The coach is like a basketball coach. Well, he, he actually is a basketball coach, converted to volleyball. And I kind of like it. He adds a little personality to the game. You know, sometimes the game gets boring, and he's out there adding some pizzazz to it. Nothing wrong with that. Well, he certainly added some pizzazz to his team on Saturday night because while we got through after settling down Friday night against him, Ohio State just barely got them in three, and in fact, they were looking at game point in game two. Well, <clears throat> they they were looking at game at game point in game two, and then waffled one out of bounds, and, and then they, then he the setter made really a bad choice going to the middle against where McMillan was standing. Not the cute setter. Uh, yeah, the cute setter. The one your <laughs> wife thinks is cute. Can't set a lick, but he's sure cute. Uh, and uh, you know, and if, if they win game two, you know, who knows what might happen. Uh, but Yvonne's team played much, much better. I thought much better Saturday night than they played against us on Friday night. Well, we may see them again next year because Raul wants to uh, regenerate that American University tournament where we've, we've played American University and Concordia the last couple of years. Well, it's a great tournament for us to go to, and that's part of the reason why I wanted to invite uh, Raul up, up here this year. And, of course, having known Yvonne was just a, a, a kind of a reciprocal agreement kind of thing that uh, they, they treat us so well down there that we wanted to bring – Raul's team up here and let them see snow for the first time in their lives, you know. Well, they that, missed that it by a couple reading. of days. Yeah, but well, we got to see a little cold weather, a little snow anyhow. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, um, if you had to summarize the weekend in terms of our team's play, where is it that we need to work this week? Well, Saturday night we kept our, our jump servers all down, if you recall, because we were trying to work on blocking, transition kinds of things. And we need to spend additional time on that. The other thing is is that our passing is not was not good all weekend not at the level it needs to be for us to be uh, successful. So we've got to spend uh, lots of time on repetition with our, with our passing. Our serving needs to be more consistent. And our side out part of our offense needs to be more consistent. I, I'm pretty pleased with our blocking. I think our blocking uh, was pretty good. And, of course, that, that's a direct reflection off of our serving. If we serve well, our blocking becomes much better. Well, and also, um, if we pass well our side out offense, most of those problems will go away too. That's correct. Panos has been real consistent passing, even though he was a little shaky on Saturday. But uh, both Hector and Jeff have to get, get stronger and more consistent at passing. Well, uh, when we come back, we'll have Hector Soto in here. We'll talk to him a little bit. And then in the last segment, we'll talk more about the Ohio State. Uh, the Buckeyes. The Buckeyes. So uh, please stay with us. the greatest generation any society has ever produced. They were ordinary people who half a century ago did nothing less than help save the world. Millions served in uniform, millions more served at home, and nearly half a million gave their lives. And yet there is no national memorial to honor their sacrifice. It is time to say thank you. Call now and help build the National World War II Memorial. Welcome back to the Arnie Ball Show. My guest this week is senior swing hitter Hector Soto. Hector, as you know, is an All-American from last year and, and one of the four or five seniors we have returning this year to, to lead this experienced team. Hector, before we talk about this year, let's talk a little bit about last year. Certainly, it had to be a major disappointment to you to get an injury so late in the season as we were obviously trying to win the MIVA and go on to a national championship. So tell us a little bit about that injury and and how it, how it affected your uh, off-season time? Um, it was a really bad experience. Um, I'm still trying to get over it. Um, I'm still having problems with my ankle. Um, but um, I've also taken it as a good experience um, for future uh, problems or future injuries that hopefully I won't have. But um, it definitely was a big disappointment for me. Um, I really thought we had a really good chance of uh, winning the championship last year, 
But um, I've put that aside, and um, I'm getting ready for this year. Probably there was as much mental anguish or pain for you as there was physical while you're sitting on the on the bench watching us play our last conference matches and go into the conference tournament. And even though you got to play uh, when we got to UCLA to the finals, you were only 50, 60 percent, and that certainly affected uh, your play there. Yeah, um, I've never been through uh, such experiences. It was my first uh, major injury, first time I have ever had to sit out and watch uh, my teammates uh, play. Um, but um, as I said, you know, I've tried to put that behind me and uh, try to focus more on what uh, I have to do this year to keep myself healthy and uh, to help my teammates. Regarding uh, your rehabilitation over the summer and the fall, in the fall you had surgery to remove some, what, bone chips or spurs or whatever, scar yeah. tissue maybe? Yeah, just uh, that was a, it was a simple surgery just to remove, yeah, a uh, piece of uh, bone, bone chip and some scar tissue. It really wasn't anything major. But it, it did cut down on your physical training during the fall, didn't it? So you had to do a little catch-up once you were released by the doctor. Yeah, um, uh, before surgery I thought that I was um, really playing at the top of my game, at least in the summer when I was uh, back home. Um, I got here and my ankle still bothered me, so uh, I did that and uh, it put me back again, you know, and that's twice this year that I have to been through, you know, rehab. But um, hopefully it's for the good reason and for the long term. Now that we're in the season, we've had our first official week. Uh, we played uh, two teams uh, last weekend that probably weren't as tough as what we're going to see in the conference, especially this Saturday night as we go to Ohio State. How do you feel the team played, and, and uh, what do you see as some things that really need focus by Saturday night to make us better? I think this weekend uh, was pretty good. Um, yeah, there is uh, stuff that we need to work on, but you know, as you said, it's the first week of... Uh, of the season, um, we we feel really confident about ourselves, and um, even though we need to work on some stuff, I still think that this coming weekend uh, should be ours. We have uh, four seniors, actually five returning starters from last year's team. We've got a freshman, um, Angel uh, Ruiz, in the in the middle who who's obviously going to learn the system with four seniors around him. It takes a lot of pressure off him. And the other uh, new addition is with the librero this year, Panos Heracleus gets to play basically full time, and that's like having a seventh player, isn't it? Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's a good addition uh, for volleyball, and I think uh, with Panos being on our team, that's our secret weapon. I think uh, he's done a great job uh, in the fall, and in these first two matches, um, he, he's he's going to help us a lot this year. One of the things that uh, seems to be quite common among Puerto Rican players is the the way you mentally work on each other and and uh, do a lot of talking under the net and you try to psych each other out and so forth. And sometimes with players, uh, when that happens, they tend to lose focus and and uh, they get out of the flow of the team and they actually their play degrades. You've always been just the opposite. That if somebody gives you a bunch of crap from the other side of the net, it just makes you play all that much better. I'm more of the quiet player, but um, when I get something from the other side of the net, you know, I don't like it very much, and I take it more as a challenge, and that's why I think that uh, my game gets better. We're going to see a, a little bit of footage here. Uh, the first play you're going to see is where uh, Hector gets blocked, and here we go. We've got it in slow motion. Hector, you want to describe this? Actually, that's when uh, that guy playing left front got hit in the face. Um, yeah, he really wasn't the one involved. I wasn't aiming for him, but <laughs> he got in the way, so I, guess I just hit it right it where it was open. At the right place, apparently. Basically, um, what happened there was that that um, you got blocked, and then the 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 little guy who blocked you didn't just do the deed, he decided to talk about it a little bit, didn't he? Yeah, I think he celebrated a little too much, and I didn't appreciate that, so, so you, you know, I looked at Chris and I told him, you know, give it back. I need to show these guys, you know, who's in command, so. I think on the bench, is when you got blocked and we saw him jawing at you, we all kind of looked at each other and said, 
uh oh, <laughs> Hector's getting the ball back, and sure enough, you hit it pretty hard. And it uh, fortunately, uh, the defender got his head turned in time, so it only caught him on the side, right? Good for him. <laughs> uh, you know, if I would have hit him in the face, it maybe it would have been different. You know, maybe I wouldn't have uh, celebrated as much because I know that hurts, and uh, it wouldn't have been nice of me. But you know, he put his shoulder in the way, so I guess that took away a little bit. But it felt good. Well, we probably don't. We hope that our MIVA uh, opponents aren't watching this show because as long <laughs> as they keep trying to get on you and get you mad, it works to our benefit. So hopefully they won't figure that out over the next four months, right? Well, they, they, I've been here for four years now, and, and every year, last year it was, uh, I believe it was Pap from Loyola, you know, and uh, that got me started for that match. But there's always a uh, Puerto Rican on the other side of the net in the Miva, so hopefully they will talk a little bit. Oh, I'm sure they will. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think uh, about this Saturday night? Uh, we've, it's basically the same team at IPFW playing, basically the same team at Ohio State. I think we each lost one or maybe two players at most. How do you think this matchup's going to go? I still think we're a, a superior team. Um, you know, if we, we compare each of our players to each of theirs, you know, with numbers, there's no way they can beat us. Um, but they, they're a great team, you know, they have a good leader in uh, AHA, and they dig balls, you know, so it's not going to be easy, but I still think that we should uh, win this weekend. One of their strengths has always been their team defense, that they keep balls up in the air, which allows them to keep the play going and wait for the other team to make a mistake. Yeah, they, they, that's, that's what they've uh, given us trouble with the past years. But uh, I think uh, the difference uh, last year was uh, our serving strength. I think uh, we've gotten uh, really good at serving, and they're not really good passers. So I think we have a couple advantages over their team. And if we can serve well and break down their passing, then they're the, probably where they're really strong, even nationally speaking, is in the middle. Those two middles that they have are really nice. And that will that will make them less part of the offense, won't it? Yeah, because uh, their middles both hit, I think, over 400 uh, last year. So if we get them out of the game, you know, that's going to be to our advantage. When we get up to Ohio State, they don't have a big crowd, but they usually have uh, uh, the what we call the Puerto Rican band there, making as much noise as they can. They like to sit directly behind the bench whenever we're down on their side of the floor. So it it's for us being playing in a big building like St. John's Arena. And not many fans there, much, much fewer and are lower in attendance than what we'd have here at IPFW. It still can get really noisy right at bench level, can it? Yeah, they, they talk a lot. Um, but, you know, they're outside. They can't hurt us. Words don't hurt. So it really doesn't uh, play an effect on us, I don't think. You know, we're really uh, concentrating on, on the game, and it really doesn't affect our game. After we play Ohio State this weekend, uh, that's on Saturday night there at Columbus, have Friday night off, but then we go on the road right away Tuesday to go to Hawaii playing a pretty big tournament too, don't we? Yeah, uh, we're psyched about that. Uh, we get a chance to go out uh, west coast and uh, prove ourselves to the rest of the nation, and uh, I think uh, timing is good. Well, Hawaii draws well out there. They've got UCLA coming in, which some feel are the best, is the best team in the country this year. And, of course, Penn State, which is much improved, I understand. Yeah. Um, last year they had a great performance at the Final Four, you know, taking BYU to four games. So um, it's going to be a good challenge for us right away, you know, to let us know where we stand for this year. Um, but I still think that we should uh, do pretty good down there. And more importantly, we're going to do well at Columbus on Saturday night. Oh, yes. That was Hector Soto, senior swing hitter for the Mastodons. When we return, Arnie will be back here, and we'll talk about a little more about that Ohio State match. So please stay with us. Mr. and Mrs. Jones, Sally's having some behavioral problems. I guess that reward system isn't working. Well, the timeouts weren't either. You know, parents do find that timeouts aren't. See? Well, you're just too lenient. Well, you're too strict. No, you are. Oh, you are. No, you are. No, you are. When adults don't have the answers, they can feel as frustrated as kids. Connectforkids.org has thousands of resources for helping kids in your community. Connectforkids.org. Guidance for grown-ups. Yeah. 
Welcome back to the Arnie Ball Show. Arnie, I got to talking to Hector about his injury and then about some other things with the team. I never got to ask him about that passing business you were talking about in the first segment, how our passing needs to improve, and Hector's one of our primary passers. And I know at the team meeting Monday, he asked certain questions uh, from uh, Coach Lisa Horman as to what, who grades our passing, charts it for you, as to what she expected it, how she expected it to be, what, how she classified it and so forth, because he really wanted to know. Well, he ought to know because we're real critical of uh, those three guys that I mentioned in the first segment about Hector and Jeff and, and Panos because they're our primary passers and we're real critical of their performance because our side out offense is directly uh, you know, re uh, affected by the way they pass the ball. And so we actually go on a three point scale and we're looking for a 2.5 overall and if that happens then our side out offense ought to be very, very good. And for a three point uh, pass, in other words a perfect pass, it has to be high to the target where the setter so he doesn't have to move off the net, along the net, and so that all hitting options are available to him. He can choose which hitter he wants to set. Well, it's real critical that it be a relatively high trajectory, and we like to have it at least 10 to 12 feet above the net because of Chris being six foot seven. If Chris jump sets every time, even whether he's in the front row or back row, the blockers on the other side have to at least hold for an instant to recognize whether he's front row or back row. And of course, when he jump sets, the quick attack becomes quicker because the lead ball, the distance the tra ball travels is much less. All to our advantage. When we play Ohio State, uh, one thing Hector said was that uh, they have a weakness in passing, probably more so than we do, and that since serving is a real strong point of our team, we got to get on our serving game, and we can really uh, cause them all sorts of problems. Is that would you see that as a key on Saturday night? You know what, Mark? I think that's a key all year long. I mean, <clears throat> that same thing was true. Boy, we hate to all go back and look at uh, the Final Four. But if you go back and look at us playing Long Beach, and if we don't make 12, 12 service errors the first game, we cut that in half. I think we win the first game. We win the match in three. Yep. I mean, it, it'll be the same when we go to Ohio State. It'll be the same when we play Hawaii. I mean, right down the line, if your serving is good, aggressive and consistent, and allow, doesn't allow the other team to get into the system, and in particular Ohio State because of what you guys talked about earlier, their strength in the middle. If we force them to go to the outside, then we have a very legitimate chance of being not only successful, but very successful against Ohio State. You know, it's really amazing. Here we're talking about uh, teams that are competing for a NCAA championship, very high level, and the keys are serving and passing, the most fundamental skills in volleyball that even six-year-old kids learn when they start playing the game. You know, it's so hard for young kids to understand what we talk about when we talk about that. It's hard for old kids to understand, older players. But, you know, two weeks ago I was up and watched the U.S. team play Canada for the Olympic qualifier. And I'm in the locker room talking to Coach Beal before the game, and he goes, Arnie, if we pass well and we serve well, we got a chance to win. So All levels. All levels, it's even the, the Olympic of, level. the name of the game, serving and passing, and everything else kind of follows. The nice thing about our serving is we uh, are very aggressive for the most part. We can run off a string of aces or, or serves where they pass them way off the court and they can't do anything offensively. We scare a lot of teams with our serving and, and knowing that you, you're willing to allow a few more errors than what a typical coach would. But like uh, Friday night we had eight errors in the first game and we weren't serving aggressively necessarily. Well, if you're gonna if you're gonna follow the philosophy that we follow, you've got to be you got to be aggressive, and you got to be willing to be aggressive at real critical times. I know some people would disagree with that, but that's just the way we believe. You know, not only, not only me personally, but our staff, because we have the talent to do it. Now, if we were a, maybe a great transition team where we could dig a lot of balls, then you become a little more safer because you sit down and dig balls. We're not a great backcourt team, and we're a pretty good blocking team, I think, but we're not necessarily a real good backcourt team. So I think you have to be real aggressive. And when you are, then you have a chance to score easy points. Easy points take the other team out of the rhythm. Psychologically, it makes it more and more difficult. I mean, it's a win-win for you. The downside is, once again, I refer back to the Canada-USA match. In game two, Canada was on a roll. One of their big guys goes up and rips one. Then he tries to serve a little cute float server and hits the server and hits the bottom of the net. Bad. you got to stay aggressive. That's right. And uh, on our team, uh, you have Denny Johnson uh, calling the serves. Every time a player goes back to serve, a coach on the bench will tell him what his target is on the other side of the court. It's, it's uh, divided up into six zones, and he tells them what zone to go after. Yeah, what's, what's interesting about Denny doing it, because he just started doing it for us this fall, or this spring, is he and I are a little bit different 
philosophically. He's not nearly as aggressive as you. <laughs> and he's a little concerned about that. But the thing that makes it kind of balances out with this team is that, you know, we have five guys that jump serve no matter what. And so it's not a matter of him going back. Because I can remember in, I, th I believe it was 94, Lloyd goes back, get match point or game point, and then he goes, down, he's got to go down. And I said, <laughs> wrong, he's up. And, and Lloyd went up, and I think we had a really good serve or whatever. But at this point, these kids are consistent enough that they're going to stay up anyhow, so it's a matter of calling zones as much as a, a philosophy of down or up. And, and if you take them down when they're used to being up, mentally they wonder what's going on, and it, it hurts them in the rest of their game. Well, we so certainly we saw, saw that, that Saturday, Saturday night. That's exactly what happened yeah. Saturday night. Well, uh, Saturday night we're at Columbus, uh, so that game's not on TV either. Big match with Ohio State, and then next week we head out to Hawaii for a very, very big tournament uh, there. For Arnie Ball, Hector Soto, and our sponsors, REMC Energy and Fujifilm, this is Mark Franke saying so long and thanks for watching. Welcome to the Arnie Ball Show. This week we're going to preview the tournament out in Hawaii we're leaving for. Our guest is Jeff Patak, and when we come back, Arnie's going to have to come up with some excuse as to why we lost at Ohio State on Saturday night. So please stay with us. called the greatest generation any society has ever produced. They were ordinary people who half a century ago did nothing less than help save the world. Millions served in uniform, millions more served at home, and nearly half a million gave their lives. And yet there is no national memorial to honor their sacrifice. It is time to say thank you. Call now and help build the National World War II Memorial. Welcome to the Arnie Ball Show. Had a little studio difficulty there during the break, and our cameraman Dan just about got taken out of the action. But we're back and going now. And and Arnie, I think everybody wants to hear from you of uh, why we went to Ohio State Saturday night, and in spite of the six-hour bus trip in the snow and not getting home till nearly 6 a.m. Sunday morning, why right in the middle of all that we managed to lose to Ohio State. So we're giving you first chance. Jeff Patak's coming on later, and he gets to rebut you, but I'll give you first shot at, as to what the reason was. I'll bet my reason won't have even close to what Jeff tells you. <laughs> well, Not even close. If this were a call-in show, we could have people vote. But. I mean, just because we had 39 serving years, which is a school record, and no service aces, and we passed it at a 2.0, we hit a pretty good percentage. They outdug us 66 to 40. Those are not even close to the reasons why we lost. Actually, our serving percentage was 1.3 when the goal is 1.7. We've you know, never served that poorly. That's still not the reason we lost. Oh, you want me to tell you? Well, I know where you're going. I'm trying to decide whether to just tell John to cut this segment <laughs> now or let you go ahead on TV and go, go ahead. It's your, it's your show. It's your wife's fault. Oh, I, that, I wasn't expecting See, you that. You were expecting that, no, were you? I thought we were going to talk about the officiating. Nope. I'm going to let you and Jeff talk about the officiating. Okay. That comes in his segment. Okay. It's your wife's doing. My wife. She had the common well, sense not to go with us. She was supposed to go with us on the trip and bailed because? She knew we were going to lose. Oh, I don't know. That, <laughs> well, that, uh -huh. her, the reason she gave me made no sense, so I figured she must have known we were going to lose. She bailed she, uh, because of the weather? She, yeah, she said the, the weather was bad, and she did not want to travel in that kind of weather because she thought something bad might happen. Then she kissed me goodbye and put me <laughs> on the bus. Didn't care about the rest of us. <laughs> the rest of us die. It's okay. I, I said, "Well, uh, your wife Sandy and Denny's wife Karen are going. All coaches are going. We got 
all the boys there, and you don't seem to care about that? You know what I figure is that somehow or other she figured out early in the week that obviously she's going to get all your money when you croak. And maybe she thought she was a beneficiary at my house and Denny's house. She'd get it all. Do you think that's what's going on? Of course, it, yeah, it could be, because the other wives were there. That's, that's right. right. I, that's the reason we lost. Okay. It's not because of all the other stuff. Not because we didn't play real well. It's because Tommy wasn't there. Tommy wasn't there. In fact, when I called her after the match about 11 o'clock just to let her know we were finished and would be leaving pretty soon, she didn't even ask who won. I finally said, well, we lost. It was close. And, and usually she starts asking a bunch of questions. She says, okay, hung up the phone. Didn't seem to care one way or another. Didn't even wish you a safe trip home or nothing. No, right? she didn't. I think I'm right. I think I think I'm right on. Well, so um, that could be one of the reasons. Uh, we'll talk to Jeff about the officiating. We, we could talk a little bit about uh, how we had real trouble scoring for long periods of time. Uh, the match was, I understand, indicative of many matches played this weekend. What well, ours was almost three hours long. Ours was over <clears> three hours, I believe which indicates a lot of siding out or a lot of serving errors. I think between the two teams, we had almost 60 serving 65. errors. 65. Oh, that's a lot. They only had one ace. Neither team served well. So um, even though they served a little better than we did, consistently keeping it in play. Uh, so certainly the match was a long match. Uh, I think in, in most generally, the long matches are good for us, you know, in, in our favor. But considering the bus ride, the length of the bus ride, uh, the time of the day, or the length of the day, or the length of the match. I think maybe in the end we got a little tired, I thought. Uh, wasn't able to keep our focus. And, of course, when you and Jeff talk about game four and Coach Ball lost his mental focus and maybe the players did a little bit also, it uh, made it just difficult for us to recover. Well, we, uh, we'll talk about that point in game four. We were down after going up two games to one. We were down in game four. Uh, but also even in game five, we started off with an advantage. We got a, uh, an early point ahead of them. So we had the advantage as long as we kept siding out. And then we had, I think, what, four hitting errors in game five, which just kills you. Well, we keep track of stuff on the bench. And, uh, I mean, you and Jeff can talk about this a little bit in the next segment. Uh, we keep track of number of points that we give up per rotation and our ability to side out per rotation. And yesterday, uh, not being able to sleep yesterday. I mean, I thought I'd be able to sleep yesterday. I mean, man, I'm wide awake <clears throat> after having no sleep at all the night, you know, on the way home, looking at the videotape and then going through our stat sheet. And we have a couple rotations where we sighted out like 35%, and then a couple that were, were at 50 55, and our goal is to shoot at about 65. We got caught in a couple rotations <clears throat> where we couldn't get out of it. And, you know, offensively, we, ex we expect a lot from all of our players. And I thought our middles offensively played as well, if not better than maybe we've played in a couple of years offensively. And I think my kid almost 600 and Angel was in the 450s, and we had pretty good numbers there. But we didn't get <clears throat> the usual offensive performance that we normally get uh, from Jeff's position and from Scotty's position. If you remember, uh, gosh, I think it was game one, Scotty went up to the blue and missed the ball. I mean, literally missed the ball. Uh, and, uh, you know, if we don't get a, a relatively high performance offensively from those two positions, then we're, then we're going to struggle. And I think on the flip side of that, uh, Chris Fash, the opposite from Ohio State, was on fire, and we, we just we, we couldn't dig the ball, nor could we slow him down back on the backside. There was one rotation where he got 10 sets on uh, what I record as the five set. It's on the pin, the front row pin on the right side. Out of 10 sets, he had eight kills and two errors. We didn't dig a single ball. And uh, there was one rotation where Ohio State sided out nearly 75% of the time. That's just phenomenal. Well, I, I thought they played as well as I think as they were capable of playing, uh, maybe with the exception of maybe they would get a service ace here or there, just like uh, we would hope to get more, more than one or two. But, uh, you know, their, their, their system I thought was very good, and they were fast to the pins. Now, we pretty much... I thought kept already under control, but Fash went crazy on us on the backside, and we didn't, not only we not block it, we just didn't dig it either. Their middles, of course, um, Kyle McMillan and Rene Estevez, may be the two best middle combinations in the country. Uh, both had nice nights, but our stats were almost as good offensively, so that wasn't really the issue. Yeah, McMill McMillan had a better night than I thought he had after I looked at the stats. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Rene was just kind of like ours, you know, same equal to ours, so that's kind of a wash. Uh, McMillan was just was better offensively than I thought he was, but we outblocked him, 
You know, so so and and you would expect with those two great big middles that they would out possibly out block us, but that's not the case. They did out dig us, and and you know we talked to our players about that all all along. They're a good defensive team. They did exactly what we said they would do. They rolled that middle back over into the left. They actually flooded the the left side of their defense, right side on our offense, and sat over there and dug balls. And when it, when we won games two and three. We were really good at attacking down the line. We got away from that in, in, in the middle of game four and in game five, partly because we didn't pass the ball very well, and they stood back there and dug balls. What Arnie's <laughs> talking about is before we left, uh, there was a team meeting, and, and what the players were told was that Ohio State was particularly susceptible down the line. But to hit down the line, the set has to be very good. And for the set to be really good, the pass should be pretty good. Well, all those have to take place. All those have to take <laughs> place. And so we didn't, we didn't attack the line as much as we should have. And we had periods when we, our offense just couldn't seem to get the ball down, too. Well, we didn't. We just didn't be. We weren't consistent as they were, and we're still a five-game match. I mean, thirty-nine. And, and we almost won. And when you look at how badly we played in a couple of ways, and to think we still almost won that thing mm. after a six-hour bus drive, you kind of wonder why not. When uh, I come back, Jeff's going to join me, and we'll ask him some of the same questions and see if the answers stay the same. Please stay with us. Mr. and Mrs. Jones, Sally's having some behavioral problems. I guess that reward system isn't working. Well, the timeouts weren't either. You know, parents do find that timeouts aren't... See? Well, you're just too lenient. Well, you're too strict. No, you are. No, you are. No, you are. No, you are. When adults don't have the answers, they can feel as frustrated as kids. ConnectForKids.org has thousands of resources for helping kids in your community. ConnectForKids.org. Guidance for grown-ups. Welcome back to the Arnie Ball Show. Before I introduce our guest for this week, I should apologize to our sponsors, who I forgot to mention during the last segment. They are Fujifilm and Touchstone Energy. Touchstone Energy is the one I never get right. It's a, it's a uh, group of six REMCs that have gone together for advertising purposes. And one of them is Northeastern RMC. I know Noble County. I forget what the other counties are. But they're all the local ones here in Northeast Indiana. Our guest this week is uh, sophomore Jeff Patak. And last weekend, when we were playing at home, we had a, a recruit in um, whose parents had come over from Poland. And the first thing they did was tell us that our public address announcer does not pronounce your name right, because he goes, he goes, p -tech. I told him that last year, too. And so it, it, it's much better phonetically in the gym, but uh, they right away knew that uh, Patak, which is Polish, was not being pronounced right in the Gate Center. That's right. I guess it means bird or something in Polish. I'm, uh, we family. thought it meant something else. But, well, no. <laughs> and it, and uh, it sounds like, the, uh, based on what Coach Ball said about your play last weekend, he wants to give you the bird. Hey, hey. He blamed everything on you. Yeah, he did. And, and then gave you I a chance to rebut too. him. How about that? Yeah, I understand. Yeah, it was... Uh, we didn't play too well last week. I don't think anybody played really well. Um, what was the problem? It couldn't. It can't be blamed just combined. on a six-hour bus drive. We've I'm not blaming on anything like that. I'm blaming on our play. Uh, um, the first game was like kind of like a warm-up because we were still like had the bus legs, you know. But uh, um, in order to win against a good team like Ohio State, you need to play hard the whole game. Everybody needs to play the best of their ability, and I don't think anybody played the best of their ability. Just. Um, we were into it, but I mean, we got really tired. By the end of the match, we were tired. Everybody physically and mentally were just pretty beat up. We uh, got there just about at game time at 7 o'clock, and I think uh, we had 25 minutes of warm up, if I remember right. And so that's not as much as we typically are used no. to. And it, it, uh, we normally start a warm up with the, the passers getting a chance to get some repetitions with the ball to loosen themselves up. Then we go into the stretching and the peppering and so forth, and all that was very abbreviated. And yeah. that, that's, and that probably was a factor in game one, but by game two and three, we had loosened up and we were, we were clearly uh, in control of those games, yet still not playing very well statistically. Yeah, we were trying to play our game the two and three. I mean, we won both those games. Uh, just, it was, just everything wasn't there, you know? I mean, uh, like I said, we weren't playing to the best of our abilities. Our serving was just terrible. We cannot get a serve in to save our lives. What was it, 39 service errors, I think 39 it was? 39 errors, no aces, a 1.3 total. 
that's that's not what we want. You know? No, it isn't. It's definitely not what we want. And uh, the passing broke down pretty much. My passing broke down really bad at the end of the game. Uh, and then just hitting errors, too. I mean, we have to have everything to beat a good team like Ohio State. In game four, we started off. Uh, things got very emotional early. I think they got a red card right at the beginning. And then uh, there were some questionable officiating calls. In fact, the officiating was really unusual this weekend. The, the head official, this, the up official, got there just before we did, so she was late as yeah. well because of the snow. She had come from Cleveland. So it was a bad night for a lot of people. But we want to show, uh, we talked about this officiating, and we want to show one segment here. When you, when you lose to a conference rival like Ohio State, it's really hard to find a highlight film. So what Arnie has chosen is a segment Jeff's going to narrate. <laughs> This is game four. Okay, here it goes. Uh, it's in slow motion. Okay, I we see. weren't that We're tired. We're serving, and uh, they get a pretty bad pass. And I think a free ball is coming over to our side, which uh, we like because we usually run a pretty good offense off free ball. Um, I think here it comes right here. Ball's going to come from the left side over yeah, our bench onto the court. Somebody stands, throws a ball onto the court uh, right about now. It should be coming, I see, somewhere. There it is. There it is. There you see it bouncing on the court. And uh, Which happened two or three times previously in the match, too, which they had to stop and uh, get a replay out of it. And uh, I was pretty fed up at this point and uh, grabbed the ball. I throw it into the stands and uh, give the refs and uh, the there crowd a there couple of There's Jeffrey launching one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was pretty angry at that moment right there. And... Uh, I just, uh, the ref gave me a yellow card, and then coach came on the court wanting to know what happened. And then he got a yellow card, which uh, in turn is a red card. So well, we lose the ball and a point. This year the new rule is uh, the yellow card, which in the past meant a warning, now actually means a point or side out. The, mm -hmm. the warnings are verbal and they are not used, a card is not used. A red card now would mean expulsion. Yeah. And so you got the yellow card. Arnie wasn't watching. He was looking at something else, talking and to one of the, probably one of the other assistants. And so he didn't know why you, what had happened. He went out, asked the, the uh, down official on the bench side. She told him that you had kicked a ball. He never saw you kick a ball, so he went across the court. The court he immediately the got a, a yellow card because coaches are not allowed on the court. So we lo it was our serve. With your yellow card, we lost the side out, then so it rotated. Then they got a point because Arnie was on the court. Yeah. It was 11-8 to eight at that time, and it was probably a point where we needed to turn that game around if we Definitely. were going to win the fourth game. We would, I guarantee we would have had that, uh, we would got the ball back, or we had a point right there, too, because it was a free ball. You know, it hacked up front. We had, uh, was it two or three hitters up front? I'm not sure, but I mean, off a free ball, you usually always, always get a side out or a point, always. The, the timing was terrible, but then again, the referee, when a ball comes on the court, has to stop the play because the players can get injured very easily in that situation. Oh, definitely, but I mean, it happened two or three times previously in the match. And, I mean, at least they could, I mean, give a, or a red, yellow card to the other team because, I mean, it came from the stands. It wasn't like a ball girl or ball boy dropped the ball. It was right from the stands. And, I mean, I was just fed up at that point and got, uh, I was pretty flustered and threw the ball into the stands. <laughs> well, you were trying to return it to the ball girl at that Oh, end. definitely, yeah. You I just kind of overshot her yeah, by about bit. 200 rows of uh -huh, seats. Just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit more about um, Ohio State. Uh, Coach Ball said in the last segment that they played very well and we didn't, yet we still went right down to the wire with them. Yeah. So uh, when we get them back here in, uh, later in the season, what are we going to do differently? What, 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 do we ha what can we do differently even if we're tired, even if there's something working against us in that regard? What do we have to do in a situation well, like that? We seem that? to play our game. I mean, we're a side-out team. And, I mean, service aid. We need to get some service aids. We had zero service aids. Um, it served horrible. Um, like they did play the best, I think they played the best they can play, you know, and we played terrible, yet we did still hung with them, you know, and quote me now, we will not lose to them again this year. I mean, we will beat them, next time we're playing at home, we'll beat them in the MIBA finals or whatever we play them, and I have that much confidence in this team, I mean, we will not play as bad as we did this weekend ever again. So do I need to make sure my wife's in the gym the next time? You might as well do that. You should do that because we will. <laughs> we'll we'll, think, we'll reach at anything, won't we? We'll yeah, grasp exactly. at any kind of, uh, no matter how, how far-fetched, we'll, we'll go for it, right? We needed her there. I mean, maybe if she would have came, we would have won. You never know. We've, uh, <laughs> obviously, we started off the conference season with a loss, but it's a long season. Yeah. Every team 
uh, plays each other twice, so we've got an opportunity to, to erase that loss by beating Ohio State the next time. Yeah, so we'll have them in our gym, so it's a big yeah. plus there. So, um, it, and it, as you say, then it comes down to the conference tournament anyways. We're playing right now for seeding in the, in the regional tournament, which mm -hmm. leads to the Final Four. But this weekend, uh, uh, we're taping this on a Monday afternoon. We're going to leave early Tuesday morning to fly out to Hawaii to play in a big tournament where we're going to see the University of Hawaii, which is playing well this year. In fact, they were tied with uh, Ohio State at, the, what, the fifth or sixth uh, ranking yeah, last week. Yeah, I think it was sixth. Uh, UCLA, which is number one, mm -hmm. and playing much better than anybody expected. And, of course, Penn State, which seems to have a better team this year than last year when they won their conference championship. Yeah, definitely. I'm uh, really excited to play at Hawaii. Uh, was it Wednesday night I think they played Hawaii? I think their first, yeah. In front of, I mean, they get a lot of people at their, at their stadium, and I'm really excited to do that. And um, just to play the high-caliber teams that we're going to play, I mean, everybody's ranked in the top ten, I think, and um, I th hopefully we'll be prepared. I think we'll be definitely prepared. Uh, we got footage on, we played Penn State before. Never, I've never played UCLA or Hawaii, but um, I think we know what they have, and just uh, I'm really excited to play them. I don't think we've played Hawaii since early in the 90s when uh, we used to go to the ASICS Classic in San Diego uh, in February, I believe, and Hawaii, who was also sponsored by ASICS, would be part of that tournament. But mm -hmm. that's the last time I can remember playing them. Yeah, I've, I've never even seen them play. Uh, I remember hearing of, uh, they've had some really good teams in the past, you know, Yuval Cots. I don't know if you, you were here mm -hmm. when they played right. them. but uh, uh, No, he, he, he was not there. He came after when we were playing. Uh, but uh, I know that, that in Hawaii, volleyball's... I mean, it's, it's the main sport, and people love it, and they're really excited to go play. Let me go back to our team for a minute. Uh, we have four seniors out there on the floor. Uh, you're just a sophomore, mm -hmm. and so, uh, and we've got a fr freshman that's replaced Ryan Parade, Angel. Yeah. So we really have four seniors and two fairly young players. So next year, the co composition of the team is going to be very different. You're going to have to assume a lot of leadership, where right now you can kind of fit in behind the, the seniors and just contribute, right? Yeah, I really, I'm looking forward to playing. Uh, where, you know, I'm one of the older guys on the team and people actually look up to me, whereas I'm in looking up to Scotty and Hector and Chris right now. They're giving me a lot of leadership. Um, I, I'm, re I'm ready to take on that role, you know. Um, right now I'm uh, struggling a little bit this season, but I know, I mean, the next couple games I'll start playing well. And uh, um, I really like our team this year. Uh, I like uh, they're doing really good. Uh, the older guys are really taking a good leadership role. Well, it gives you a chance to play with a little less pressure because you're in what we call the number two swing position. Uh -huh. You're you're two away from the setter rather than next two, which uh, takes some offensive pressure off of you. Yeah. And it gives you a chance to to develop some experience, some maturity, mm -hmm. improve your skills, and then next year you'll have to step up, won't you? Yeah, definitely. I'll hopefully get moved to the uh, the next two position. You know, next to the setter where I should get more swings and. Uh, Usually the outsides get the most swings in the team, and right now I'm getting a lot of swings, so I'm happy with what's going on. Real quick, in the last 10 or 15 seconds, what's your major, Jeff? Uh, elementary education. And you're from near Buffalo, right? Yep, right outside of Buffalo, Hamburg, New York. Right outside of Buffalo, New York. That's uh, outside hitter Jeff Tack, and uh, when we come back, Arnie will join us, and we'll talk a little bit more about the Y tournament, so please stay with us. Get the keys. Friends don't let friends drive drunk. Welcome back to the Arnie Ball Show. Arnie, uh, Jeff, last segment guaranteed that we'd beat him next time. That's a sophomore speaking, isn't Jeff, it? <laughs> Jeff guarantees a lot of things. He, uh, he's exuberant with confidence, and that's a nice thing to have. Yeah, you'd rather have him over... Overly confident than uh, scared to death, right? Jeff's been like that ever since he got here. <laughs> There's no reason to think that he's going to change. <clears throat> uh, forgetting Ohio State for now because uh, that's in the past. We've got a big tournament this weekend, and as we talked last segment, we have some big matches to determine how well we stack up nationally when it comes to May and Fort Wayne, and we want to win it all. Well, certainly it would have been nice to, to go to this tournament with a win. Uh, but in the same token, may, maybe the uh, performance that we had at Ohio State will inspire us to play uh, this weekend at a, at a higher level than what we played uh, against Ohio State. 
And when you go over there, uh, being the first experience for any of these players uh, from our team to, to have gone over there and played, you know, I've been there before, but it'll be uh, not only an exciting time because it's Hawaii, but it's also an exciting time because Hawaii is the leading uh, uh, school in the country, has been for the last three or four years in attendance, and they've been averaging right at about 6,000 fans. And I'm sure that when we roll in there on, on Wednesday, there'll be close to 6,000 fans there, and it ought to be, ought to be a great time for a great environment for our kids to play in. Well, um, obviously they need to get their game back together to where, you know, Jeff may be confident, but I think after a loss like we just had, the confidence of the team does go down a little bit, doesn't it? They need a good night to, to bring that back. Well, I think that's certainly true. Uh, and the thing that will bring us back as quick as anything is if we have a good serving night. Right. You know, I mean, that, <clears throat> that's kind of what we... I uh, have premised this team all, all about as being really good servers, and when we didn't, that didn't happen to us, we just lost some of that, that rhythm, some of that self-confidence. So if we can go over there and get adapted to the time difference uh, fairly quickly, and I think we will, and have a, a good serving night. Uh, we have tape on Hawaii. You know, They have two really outstanding players, one Clay Stanley and the other kid's name I can't pronounce, uh, but they're both outside hitters. Now, they have a couple of nice middle hitters too, but they're both 6 5 so they're not real big. Uh, I think if we we play our game like like we're capable of playing, uh, we we will have really a good match, and we need to have a good match that first night, uh, <clears throat> not only to just uh, get our legs underneath us, but to develop that confidence that you talked about, because the second night we play UCLA, and they seem to be playing very very well right now. Yeah, I think they've surprised some people. They're top of the the rankings right now, and people and for the most part they weren't expected to be there when the season started. No, they weren't, and they really have other than Talaferro, the the setter. Uh, you know, most of the, most of the kids are re relatively new. Even I guess the big opposite was there last year, and uh, <clears throat> but they have some new kids, and they they apparently be gelling pretty pretty well early. You know, they beat Long Beach, who at one that time was number one, and they since have beaten Pacific, who who beat BYU, and BYU who beat Hawaii. So <clears throat> the whole thing is kind of jumbled up, but. Sure appears that UCLA has uh, moved to the top fairly quickly. After we come back from Hawaii, we go right back on the road two more weekends, don't we? We go to Penn State and Mercyhurst, and then we go to Loyola and Clark and uh, Quincy. So we've got we've got <coughs> four conference matches coming up in the next two weekends, as well as another match with Penn State. Yeah, when we when we look that far ahead, uh, the Mercyhurst match is the one that concerns me the most because we're only going to have. Uh, actually three and a half days until we leave again uh, for the kids to get caught up on school and to try and get ready for Mercyhurst. And Mercyhurst beat Ball State, as we know, a couple weeks ago. And Ball State beat Loyola last weekend. So, uh, And we traditionally don't play very well at Mercyhurst. Now, we have to go to Penn State the next weekend, but Penn State's got the same problem we got. You know, They're coming back from Hawaii also. So that kind of is a wash, and we'll know something about one another. And uh, even though we know a lot about Mercyhurst, uh, it's just sometimes really hard to get these kids understand every conference match is really important. Right, and that we found that out last Saturday night, didn't we? Yeah. We st we're starting at the <clears throat> bottom of the conference. But it's much easier to get those kids excited about Ohio State than it is Mercyhurst. Sure. And, you know, once again, you play Penn State right after that, and they're looking forward to playing Penn State again after we play them this, this week. Uh, it's, it, the schedule is really difficult for the next three weeks. We're going to find out what our kids are made out of in the next three weeks. It's probably better to go on the road in January and February than to spend all of April on the road. Well, I think so. That's probably the reason why our schedule is built like it is. And, uh, you know, obviously we're playing very, very good competition, but the real key is to be really good in April. It uh, doesn't mean I don't want to be good when we play Hawaii. Well, I wanted to be good last week. Uh, we want to be good when we, when we go play Mercyhurst, but we need to be really good in April so that we have a chance to play in May and uh, be at the best of our top of our game. Exactly. <coughs> I do need to, to uh, tell you that uh, we have t Arnie and I have taped a segment for the uh, Indiana Purdue Student Government Association update, where we talked about uh, student government, the players' involvement in it, our involvement with it when we, back when we were students, back in the, the really old days. And those two, those segments, that segment I should say, will air twice on January 28th and February 5th at 1 p.m. each day on College 56. And I just got uh, got chewed out by John back in the control booth for promoing Dan the owes, show. We'll owe us forever. Dan owes us forever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I want to thank everybody for watching this show. Uh, for our sponsors, Touchstone Energy, Fujifilm, our guest Jeff Patak, and Coach Arnie Ball. 
<laughs> this is your host, Mark Bronke, saying thanks for watching, and please join us again. Welcome to the Arnie Ball Show. This week we're going to talk about the tournament out in Honolulu where the Macedons did not play very well and lost three matches. Arnie is in fact still in Hawaii and replacing him today is Blake Sebring from the new Sentinel. So please stay with us. It was called the greatest generation any society has ever produced. They were ordinary people who half a century ago did nothing less than help save the world. Millions served in uniform, millions more served at home, and nearly half a million gave their lives. And yet there is no national memorial to honor their sacrifice. It is time to say thank you. Call now and help build the National World War II Memorial. Welcome to the Arnie Ball Show. I'm your host, Mark Franke, and our sponsors today are Touchstone Energy and Fujifilm. Arnie, as I said earlier, is still in Hawaii taking care of uh, some personal matters, I think, on the golf course. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're taping this, by the way, on Tuesday, so he stayed an extra day or two after the team came back. Blake Sebring from the New Sentinel is joining me today. And uh, Blake was not out there in Hawaii, so he doesn't know anything about what went on. And I do, so we're going to reverse roles, and Blake is going to interview me here for the, the first segment. Uh, Mark, I think everybody thought when you went out to Hawaii, you did so with high hopes, and, but you knew it was the toughest part of your schedule, and then you guys get out there after the loss at Ohio State, and things just kind of fell apart. Things, um, something was wrong. Uh, we had lost at Ohio State on Saturday night, and the long road trip in the snowstorm, we felt contributed to that and even though we lost it we lost in five and we played poorly but we took it all the way to the to the end with Ohio State and so you know you shrug off those losses and you think we play everybody twice in the conference and it's a long conference season we can make that loss up and then we went to um, Hawaii on Tuesday and it was about a 24-hour day the flight was 10 hours for the the major leg of it. I think we're 13 hours traveling we scheduled practice at 8 o'clock uh, Hawaii time, which is five hours later than ours, so that because on Wednesday night we played and Arnie wanted the team to be acclimated. Actually, it's five hours earlier than ours, so it'd be one o'clock in the morning here. It was pretty late, so I don't know what you want to call it, but it was late. Yes, five hours, whatever. These kids are up at that late anyway, aren't they? The kids might be, but the coaches aren't. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was a struggle, and we, I thought we had a fairly good practice. They worked hard, but I think probably the the fatigue from the travel caught them the next day. We played Hawaii, uh, the home team. They had 5,000 people in the gym. In fact, they had 6,500 on the last night. So they, they were in the five to 6,000 range every night. And they played well. A number of people, including the TV people who were doing the show, said that that was as well as they've seen Hawaii play in a long time, that they really were up to play us. We played UCLA on uh, Wednesday night, or Thursday night, I should say, and, and we played much better, and we're very competitive in that, but lost, and there's still some fatigue evident. Friday night we played Penn State. Penn State had been beaten up worse than we had, and so we thought this is going to be an ugly match. Both teams are here. Uh, this doesn't mean anything. We've lost the teams we really wanted to beat, so we'll see what happens. And it, was, it wasn't real good. But um, they won in four. We had led in all four games, and so that was a really disappointing loss for us. Well, the interesting thing, I think, is this is by far the worst part of your schedule. Um, you travel, you go to Ohio State, you come back, you go to Hawaii. This weekend, you got to go to Mercyhurst and Penn State, and then you're pretty much done no, traveling. One more week. We have four Long weekends Beach. on the road. 
Oh, that's right. Well, that that trip is not as bad. That's a th we play three days. We play Friday night, Saturday afternoon, Sunday afternoon. We go all the way to the Mississippi River. Yeah, we've got this month. These four weeks are the bad part of the travel. After that, there's only one big trip left, and that's the Long Beach tournament in uh, March during spring break. But even then, with this trip, with that last trip, it's still there's Clark and there's Quincy, two guaranteed wins around a Loyola match, which could be pretty good. Loyola has uh, lost to Ball State, and they've they were playing out west and play very well. So um, who knows? We. Loyola's only beaten us once. It was the very first time we played. It was in an alumni gym, that little second floor uh, gym with their national championship banner from 1950 whatever. 65. 65. And the students get in there and they yell and scream. It's, it, it should get our players fired up, hopefully. Well, then tell me about this weekend. I think the Penn State match, which is on Saturday, is now much, much more important at Penn State. But then you can't overlook Mercerhurst, which also plays very, very well at home. Mercyhurst beat Ball State in Erie, which surprised everybody. So they've all, they've always been a team that's very competitive, but not quite good enough to beat the big boys. And uh, apparently they've gotten their first uh, giant to fall with Ball State. And Ball State turned around and beat both Lewis and Loyola. So things are interesting in the conference. Uh, we've never played well in Erie. I think it's the five and six hour drive to get there. We get out and go into the gym. So. Arnie scheduled us to leave at 8 o'clock on Friday morning to give us more time in between arriving and when we have to play. And hopefully that will, will help a little bit. The Penn State match is important because if both teams get to the Final Four, usually what happens is the Midwest and the East Coast teams fight for the number three or number four seed. Well, if you have two losses to Penn State already and they're going to go, and they are pretty much going to go, they are the class of the East, that means IPFW would be looking at a number four seed for the Final Four, and number four seeds have never won a match in the Final Four. I think uh, Penn State's going to be important for that reason. We play them two more times, uh, once there and once here. Our loss out there to Penn State puts us behind the eight ball on that one. But And also when it comes to seeding, a win against Hawaii and UCLA would have certainly um, put us in a good position, assuming, of course, we win the MIVA tournament in April, where we had to go back to St. John's Arena in Columbus, and we don't play well there. So uh, that that's something that will have to become a focus in April. It's kind of interesting with the start of the season, you look at the schedule and you think, wow, everything's set up just perfectly. You know, if they can get through the first month and they do well there, they can coast home. Now, that's not the case, and you guys got to find a way to get the competition and, and turn things around. Well, obviously, we have to focus on the conference play. Uh, we've started off 0-1 in the conference, and uh, we, of course, play Ohio State again at home. We've got to play Ball State twice, Loyola, Lewis, all those teams twice. So we need, uh, over these next two weekends, we need those four conference wins to get us back on the top and put us in a good position to, to compete uh, as the leading team in the conference. Well, and the leading team in the conference, is that as important this year because the, because the MIVA tournament is going to be at Ohio State? I mean, you pretty much know you're going to have to beat Ohio State sometime during that weekend to go to the Final Four. Well, I think seeding the conference tournament is important, too. The number one seed is really what we're playing for. Last year we didn't have the number one seed, so we had the tougher road to go because with Hector's injury at the end of the season, we lost to Ohio State right at the end, gave them the number one seed. I think this year we'd really like to have that because that makes then the uh, Friday night match uh, just maybe a little easier than if you were a second or third seed. Um, how important is it that you guys play well on the road? Because you know you're going to have to win at Ohio State. You're going to have to beat Ohio State at Ohio State at the end of the year to go to the Final Four. I mean, no matter what else happens, it's going to come down to that. Well, normally uh, going on the road is difficult, and you try to focus to really play well on the road, although we've noticed that when it comes to tournament time, uh, the, all the hype around a tournament makes it difficult for the home team. Last year, Lewis had the tournament. They thought they were going to win it with Hector being injured and all. We took them out in the semifinals easily. And I think you've done the research. It shows in the MIVA, what, only once in the last 20 years or something, the home something like team that. has actually won the MIVA tournament. Oh, and the number one seed's almost as bad. The number one seed doesn't win either. So we don't want that either. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting, I mean, especially if the number one <laughs> seed is playing at home in the tournament, it's over, forget it, they have no chance. <laughs> You'd think they'd be a walk then, but they have no chance. Well, all we have to do then is lose to Ohio State again, and, and uh, they might as well not even show up for their own tournament. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think Pete will be real happy to hear that. Yeah. Uh, the, the issue of playing home versus on the road, I, I like playing at home, and I think our players do because our fans are there. 
and it makes it nice. But there is something to be said about playing on the road because you remove all that distraction. And when it comes to a big tournament, that might be easier. But when you travel a five-hour time zone difference and you go, you're in January, it's snowing back home, you've got all these northern, northern kids uh, out in warm, sunny Honolulu, Obviously, the, the human uh, nature would say, this is a nice vacation. I guess I'll play some volleyball while I'm here. <laughs> We're going to talk a little bit more about that and go into some specifics as to our play this last weekend when we return. So please stay with us. Brian's a student that I had in my resource class. Um, came from a very poor background. Brian just needed a friend. So we paired him with a, a community leader. He would take him to rodeos, and then he would take him to plays and different things that this child would never have been exposed to. This man taking his time to come and have lunch with him meant more than anything. Point a kid in the right direction. This is General Colin Powell of America's Promise. Call us and help keep America's Promise. Welcome back to the Blake Sebring Show. And this week, uh, Blake sitting in for oh, there Arnie. There go the ratings. There go the ratings, yeah. <laughs> Blake sitting in for Arnie. Uh, is, we're going to continue what we did last segment. He's going to keep asking me the questions. And in this segment, we're going to focus a little bit more on specific techni technical aspects of our game over the last two weeks and try to decipher what, what's wrong with the team right now because we're not playing well, quite frankly. Well, Mark, the one thing I've noticed statistically which I thought would be the strength of the team would be the serving. I mean, you guys were got, I think it was 12 aces against Concordia right off the bat. Just served great against, which is, should be a pretty good team, but then it fell apart against Ohio State and at Hawaii. What's going on with the serving? Boy, that's, that's uh, a real interesting point. We've always been a very aggressive team, or I should say over the last couple of years, the focus has been on very aggressive serving, which means we're willing to accept more errors than most teams. We, we uh, chart every serve on a scale of zero to four, and then we combine that. Uh, it's one of the stats I keep on the on the bench, and we, we we really look for three key factors. One is the ace to error ratio, and and we'll go for one to three. Most teams will go for one one to two. We'll allow three errors for every ace. We also go for an average over that zero to four scale. Uh, if a good pass counts as a one for a serve and an ace counts as a four and so forth. And you look at that, you're, we're, we shoot for a 1.7 as an average for the team. Against Ohio State and against Hawaii, we serve 1.3. And then against UCLA and against uh, Penn State, we were 1.5. A couple of years ago when we were struggling a little bit, I, I think this was probably 94. In fact, there's some scary resemblances between this team and 94. Uh, I had done some analysis and I told Arnie, when we serve our 1.7 goal, we never lose. When we serve below 1.5, we never win. Hmm. So that 1.5 to 1.7 is a competitive match. So this year, we haven't reached 1.7 yet. Uh, we've had two 1.3s and a 1.5, and we'll forget about the Concordia and, um, and uh, American. American because that, that probably wasn't really the kind of challenge that the bigger teams are going to be, the, the, uh, the top 10, top 15 teams. Well, what is the problem? I know in, this, in, in IPFW's Gates Center, I mean, we talk about the drafts all the time and how and there are drafts in there anybody who sat in there and had to put your coat on during a match you know because the, the breezes sometimes knows that there is a draft in there but we were playing on the road what's the problem are guys reaching too high or trying to hit some it too of, hard some of it is technique uh, dave schmidlin called the serves out in hawaii denny johnson did at ohio state so we've had two different approaches denny tends to be more conservative than dave dave's very aggressive mm -hmm. Um, Dave watches their technique and, and he talks about whether their, their tosses are good or not. They, they're supposed to, for the most part, toss the ball on the court and really attack it high enough that they can go after it. One thing that, you know, the rules change that you can no longer let the toss drop. You have to hit that first ball. And our players sometimes, when they have a bad toss, still try to wail at the ball instead of just getting it over. Well, and if you're doing a float serve, you can still drop it, right? I mean, I've seen that a couple times well, I don't this know. year. I thought I'd seen that a couple times. A float times. server can drop it? I'd, hmm. and then maybe if they just drop it without letting tossing it up. That could be. Uh, the other thing, f serving is a little bit like free throw shooting in basketball. You know, most coaches will practice at the end of practice when they're tired, and, and as you get tired, you tend to make more service errors. UCLA served very well 
uh, but had a lot of errors against us, and even more the next night against Hawaii. So uh, everybody seems to be having the same kind of problem where they, uh, there's really great servers go into spells where they have trouble. It's interesting because that was supposed to be the strength of the team with Chris and Hector and, and Scott and Jeff. I mean, and then Angel comes in and jumps too. I mean, those were, you probably had the best serving team returning of any team in the country, and it just hasn't worked out. Well, I think we had the best serving team last year in the country, and this year something's very, very wrong with that. And it could be just that we haven't gotten into our rhythm, and, and maybe with all the travel and, and the short training weeks and so forth have had something to do with it, I don't know. Well, to put it in a baseball analogy, is everybody trying to hit a home run on every swing? Well, we've talked to them about that over the years, that there are certain points uh, where you don't try to hit a home run. You just try to get on base or move the runners using the baseball analogy. The third stat that's important that I keep, and this is somewhat subjective on my part, we have what are called bonehead serves. And those are really stupid serves. For instance, if you, if you serve an error after a timeout, you get a boner. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you serve an error after an ace, you get it. And sometimes I'll, I'll forgive that one if it was a close error. Right. Or if you do one on the first serve of the game, or if you cut off a runner, any, any service error after 12 points. We have had a lot of those in the past. And the interesting thing was at UCLA, we only had one bonehead serve, and that's the lowest it's ever been. <laughs> so I don't know what that was, why that was. Maybe, we, maybe we'd taken something off, because the more aggressive you are, the more likely you're going to have that. All right, so let's look at the other half of the court now. The passing seems like it has broken down quite a bit. UCLA had, I think, 11 aces or 11 or 12 aces against you, and that I never would have expected to see that stat. The passing uh, is the converse of serving. The stat's the opposite, and so uh, the goal there is 2.5 out of a scale of 3, which is pretty high, but you, a 3 pass is one that allows you to run your offense. Anything, out of that, anything lower than that, if you can't run the entire offense, we call it being out of system, and so you uh, have to use release sets or obvious sets, and, and the blockers can load up. Well, we've, we served 1.7 against, or passed 1.7 against Y, I believe, and I think the other two nights were like 2.0. We're not passing well. And uh, even at our level, passing and serving is what volleyball is all about. It's those two basic skills that make everything else happen. So, our, for instance, our middle, the other thing that we've been very good at historically, our strength has been our side-out offense. We c if you can side out, nobody can beat you because they can't score against you. We would go into, into streaks where we'd get three to six points because we couldn't side out, and that starts with that passing. And it, what is the problem? I mean, did guys, the guys knew they were going to be good this year. Did they come back too cocky? Did they not work hard enough over the summer, or is it just a bad spell? Well, we thought that maybe they read some of the stuff you've been writing about. It, and <laughs> that didn't help. <laughs> they... I think maybe some of that is the case, that they came back knowing that we almost won it last year, came very close on Thursday night against Long Beach. In fact, if it hadn't been for that bad call, I think we'd have won on Thursday night. And then who knows what would have happened with Brigham Young on Saturday afternoon for the, for the whole show. And knowing everybody's back but Rock and Javi, that uh, I think maybe there was a, uh, maybe too much overconfidence. And then going into a bad travel schedule, and all of a sudden we lose, and now everybody wonders why. Well, I would think the good news is you still have a tremendous amount of talent. You probably have the most individual talent of any IPFW team ever, and you, if it can get it turned around, there's still a long way to go yet. Yeah, I, I, a lot of people out there, in fact, one, uh, a fan who has a son at another MIVA school said that clearly we're the, the most talented team in the MIVA and we'll be okay. We just have to settle down and, and start doing what we do well and that's going back to our serving, getting our passing back to where it ought to be. If we don't reach the 2.5, which is a pretty high goal, go back to the 2.4 that we tried to achieve in previous years. If our serving comes back and it looks like it's starting to, and our side-out offense starts running appropriately, um, we, may st we still may not be looking at the top of our game, but if you, side if you serve well and side-out, nobody's going to beat you. And then as long as um, that's going on, you have time in volleyball because there's no clock no uh, automatic scoring that you can you can always turn things around. When we come back uh, for the last segment, I think Blake will still be here because I don't think Artie's going to get back from Hawaii in the next three minutes. So uh, stay with us and we'll talk more with Blake Seaver.
every day, 10 children are killed by gunfire. You can help stop the violence. Call 1-800-WE-PREVENT. Not one more lost life. Not one more grieving family. Not one more. Gone to graveyards one by one. Oh, when will we ever learn? Welcome back to the Arnie Ball Show. We left last segment talking about some of the technical problems we're having with the uh, basic skills of the game, passing and, and serving. Let's talk a little bit more about passing. Uh, Blake, you asked me during the break here, how do you fix something like that when it's broken? And I wish Coach uh, Lisa Horman were here because passing is her responsibility on the team. And um, So you're blaming Cheeks now. Yeah, it's Cheeks' fault. Was... Gosh, <laughs> I tell you. You're making a lot of friends on this show, Mark. Yeah, they'll all hate me by the time we're done here. <laughs> She uh, she's the one who who tracks that during the match and and works with it. So passing is really not a difficult skill because it's a very basic skill. That, you know, little kids learn that's the way you handle the ball that is with you know the well, forearm pass. It looks, so it's forth. not a difficult, but it, it's very difficult to do it well. It, you know, we have Jeff and and Hector back as our primary passers this year. Rock was in three rotations last year would be our third for the jumpers, and Rock was a very good ball handler. Mm -hmm. uh, Ryan Parada, I should say. We, the players called him Rock, and there's a story about that, how he almost drowned once in a, in a lake. I thought it was because he was so steady. No, no, it was because he sank like a rock when they were in the lake. <laughs> but uh, uh, This year, because of the librero, Apanos Eracleus, who's our librero, now becomes a primary passer. He's in there th three, all six rotations, I should say. So he, that's, that's taking some getting used to because now he's always there. He has to learn to pass with the other two who are somewhat used to working together now. Now, Panos is, is new to that, but I, I think they ought to be able to work that out. And it should make things easier. Well, you'd think so. You'd think it'd make things easier with the same three passers all the time. Passing is a, you know, it's really a, you need to stay loose, it's concentrate, it's, it's you against the server one-on-one. -on -one. There's You ought to be able to do it, you would think. Well, I would think also, Mark, if you got three guys, there's a lot less court to cover for two guys. Uh, that's partly true, but the other thing is now there are five seams or five alleys where you can serve because you got the two outside ones and instead of just one alley or seam between them now you have two in between so that's, I guess that's four all together and anytime you have a seam where two players are going to come together you have a chance for miscommunication for all sorts of things and then we saw a lot of that in Hawaii where one passer would jump in front of the other when it really wasn't his pass okay conversely when you're serving yeah, you know, every every other team is going through the exact same thing this year, because this is the first year of the libero rule. It's not working out to IPFW's advantage on the other side. Well, you think it'd make it easier for the for the server, and I think once our serving uh, settles down a little bit, we'll find that it'll increase our our serving effectiveness. But on the other hand, because we're so aggressive with serving, that we tend to you know just hit the ball as hard as we can and try to get uh, some top spin on so it drops quickly. Uh, we don't control it maybe as much as some other teams do where they try to work and move the passer. How do you get top spin on it? Uh, you kind of, Denny Johnson, now there's a coach who, who knows the top spin. So now issue. you're blaming Denny oh, then too? Blame Denny. So what you, it's the way you contact the ball and hit it. So it's kind of like, you know, anytime a ball rolls, if it's spinning this way, it's going to come down. If it spins, you, I don't know how you'd make it spin the other way, but if you don't get it on, it goes flat, it just keeps going. And I think you've seen some of our serves, even a hitter, I know I've hit a few of those. Yeah, some uh, <laughs> some of our hitters have been very good at that, where they hit the ball and it just keeps going up and up and up. There's no top spin on that ball, obviously. That's like my tennis game. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Actually, there's a lot of in serving with tennis. The same kind of motion, the same kind of approach. How much is it does it take out of your shoulder to jump serve? Well, that. Uh, you're going to have to ask the trainer. Because <laughs> I, I figured Geisman that's got to be a factor. I know last. Last spring, Chris Gislin's shoulder was bugging him a lot, and I think it's healed now from what I understand. But, I mean, it, it's not a natural function of your arm. It has to take something out of it. True. It, uh, maybe a lot of people don't know this, but last year when I went to the finals, Chris Gislin had a pinched nerve. In fact, even in the MIVAs, couldn't hardly swing. And he was one of our leading servers, and he didn't get an ace in the, against Long Beach. And you think that if he, he hadn't had that pinched nerve, let alone Hector's injury, I mean, we just came so close. I think... That's what's got people right now wondering why we're having trouble when we almost won it all last year. Oh, this is where we find out how good a coach Arnie really is. Yeah. It, 
obviously the losses need to be laid at Arnie's feet here. So. <laughs> <laughs> Arnie, Mark said that. I didn't say that. <laughs> uh, regarding the, the shoulder issue, someone who was there, uh, I think she's a physical therapist or something, and as a friend of Chris's had fo has followed him, said that he really, he really wasn't getting his shoulder turned properly like, or like he would normally do, and that perhaps maybe psychologically he's favoring it knowing that it has been injured or whatever. Which is understandable. Yeah. I mean, you can overanalyze a lot of these things, and, and primarily when the players go out, volleyball's not like football where you want the players to go out all fired up and headbutt and run around and get crazy. You want volleyball players to play fairly steady, not emotionally from the standpoint that it's a long, long match. They can't keep an emotional high all that time. So you want them to have that burst of adrenaline or that emotion necessary at a, at a given point, but then quickly get down to the level they're supposed to play at. Okay, as an assistant coach, and you have admitted before you're not a technical volleyball guy, how do you, as an assistant coach, make sure that everybody doesn't overanalyze all this? Uh, that they don't overanalyze yeah. it? Yeah. I mean, coaches and the players, well, everybody. One way that uh, the way volleyball is set up that you can't overanalyze is we only have one minute timeout, so you can't tell the players a lot. Between, uh, during a timeout, and only three minutes between games as a rule, if there's not a promotion going on. So there's not a lot of time to do that kind of adjustment. It all has to be trained uh, during the week. So you're just looking for the fine tuning things, and we probably spend more time on tactical issues than technical issues during, during a match. That's, that's where I can help because my job is to, is to anticipate what the next move of the opponent's going to be. What would what'd the coaches maybe say after this tournament? Just blow it off and we'll just move on? Or is there something that you guys can take out of this? Or how do you approach it? Well, anybody who knows Arnie Ball knows he's not the kind that's going to say, ah, just blow <laughs> it off. We don't worry about it. He's, he is an emotional person. He, uh, in fact, someone told us once we're a bunch of, we're really redneck volleyball. Our coaches are redneck. Our players are blue collar. And that's, there's, there's some truth to that. The Midwest. Especially I mean, after the matches when you guys go out. There's no doubt about that. This is a family, family channel. I didn't mention here, anything <laughs> specific. <laughs> well, most of us are Lutheran, and we know what Lutherans are, <laughs> what their favorite beverage is. So um, I think uh, I have no idea what you just asked. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you, what, do you, what do the coaches talk about after the losses? I mean, do they, With the players? Yeah. No, maybe amongst themselves. Or, or not, I don't want to inside secrets, but what, how do you guys approach it now as coaches? Well, you know, Arnie says, what went wrong if we lose or what do we need to do to improve it? And the coaches all talk. And of course, um, Cheeks and Dave are very good at, at uh, the technical kinds of things and can help with that. Denny's got, been with Arnie for a long time. He's been in the game a long time. He has a very different uh, perspective as well. So it's, it's a nice staff in terms of the different perspectives coming in. Well, I think you guys probably have the most... The largest coaching staff maybe in the by country? By weight or by number. <laughs> by number. <laughs> we also have the oldest on average because uh, there's three of us that are in the 50s range. So. Well, I mean, if you're going to keep cutting on yourself like this, we're going to have to <laughs> pretty much wrap this up quickly. <laughs> you're in enough trouble already as it is, Mark. <laughs> well, a lot of it, uh, we've got to go, we've got 30 seconds left here, but a lot of it is the seniors. We have four seniors in the starting lineup. They need to get together and say, we've got to go on. We don't want to fracture because we're the leaders of the team. There's a limit to what coaching can do. And I think we've got some good seniors who, who will get together. They're going to meet weekly now and, and try to make sure they stay on top so of the So maybe game. it'll be a positive. It, it should be a positive, we hope. For our special guest, Blake Sebring, and for the absent Arnie Ball, and our sponsors, Touchstone Energy and Fujifilm, this is Mark Franke saying thanks for watching and so long. <laughs>